No my hooky my welcome back to End Zone Focus. Before the break I spoke with Glenn Carpenter from the New Zealand Christian Network about the conference held earlier this year by the network during Waitangi Week. Well, our next guest was one of the keynote speakers at the conference, which focused on the relevance today of the Christian message first delivered to a combined Māori and European gathering nearly 200 years ago. Reverend Panikafia says it's a blessing to have received that Christian legacy and spoke to me about how the gospel spread from those early beginnings through to her iwi of Ngāti Prau, the North Island East Coast tribe. I do have a personal legacy to the gospel, which I'm very proud of. Throughout the 1700s and 1800s, Ngāti Pro was um, attacked by parties from the northern tribe of Ngāpuhi, and uh, they would come and take captives back. And to cut a long story short, one of the captives that came back from Ngāpuhi, he, uh, while he was there, he received Christian instruction and was given his freedom um, with the help of the missionaries, was returned to Ngāti Poro and he became our first evangelist amongst the uh, tribe. My great-great-great-grandfather, uh, Rani Rakafia, heard that message from this evangelist. His name was Piripito Matahakura. And my tipuna, em, or ancestor, embraced that message for himself and he became a teacher of the scriptures amongst the people and eventually became the first Ngāti Pro Anglican minister. His son was also a minister and uh, so that made him my great-great-grandfather and I'm now an Anglican minister. And so when I was ordained in 2007, I wanted uh, to use that opportunity to restore the memory of this legacy that we have. So I got ordained on the day that Raniera was ordained and in the place that he was ordained, just to make those links and to remind our whānau and our hapū that uh, this is very much part and parcel of our heritage. What was the relationship like between your iwi, your iwi leaders and the early missionaries? The first uh, missionary that came was William Williams, uh, the brother of Henry Williams. and. Um, he did, by the time he came down to Ngāti Puro, uh, Puripito Matahakura and these other evangelists who are generally known as Ngāf Kaifaka or Tokofa, the four evangelists, and, uh, and that included my tipuna, my ancestor, they had done a good job. And so at the first service, there were almost 900 uh, people who attended that first service who had in some way been influenced by the gospel message brought by Tomata Hakura. So these uh, early missionaries were amazed by that and they uh, would disciple the leaders of um, our tribe. They were on good terms with the uh, tribe. A lot of those who came to faith were leaders in the tribe. And so they uh, helped with education. William Williams set up a theological college in Gisborne called Te Reo, uh, Te Reo Kahikatea. And uh, that building still stands and the church have uh, brought it back and we have our bishop's office there now. So it's still being used for theological training. And, um, and so he, William Williams did a lot of work there and he was on good terms with the, uh, with what can the church do to improve their relationship with Māori? I think a good place to start because we are here in Waitangi and um, over the last two or three days I've had conversations with people who have never been to Waitangi before, who don't have a uh, even a small knowledge of what Waitangi is all about and what the treaty was all about but having been here and heard and seen and experienced they now want to go back and bring their families next year and so that's something simple that members of the church can do is come to Waitangi and know that we as the church have a very important role in, in uh, this document and in this uh, living this document out in the country so that's one thing another thing is to or attend Waitangi celebrations wherever they live 
Another thing is individuals can go and learn te reo Māori or the Māori language. And with that, they will learn a whole lot more of uh, our, our ways and our worldview, which will bring understanding. And so that's a, a huge way too. Um, today in the Congress, we've also talked about the value of having treaty workshops run by Christians that are a safe place for people to be honest and to speak heart to heart and to uh, people to learn the facts about the treaty, what really took place. Many who, who critique it or criticize the treaty or don't think it's relevant really don't know the facts of what actually took place. And I've been in many situations where you will see Pākehā in tears. It's like an emotional roller coaster. So there are highs and there are lows that people go through, but often end up in tears when they hear just exactly what has happened. And um, it's also good for Māori who are not fully aware of what took place. But it's not to leave it there, it's to ask the question, what do we do about it now? And so things like learning te reo, things like understanding that Māori, we do have a different way of looking at life. We have different priorities, even though it's, it's, they're still based on economics and, um, and, and family and all those things, but uh, there are differences, and if we can understand this, uh, we are not all the same. We are one nation, but we are not all the same. And uh, that is often a result too of a workshop or a wānanga, if we have it on a marae, um, Pākehā, and other New Zealanders, non-Māori, will come. And just through that experience, they are confronted with this, there is a difference. And yet it's a very embracing difference. Nearly 200 years on since the first gospel message was preached in Aotearoa, what are the challenges ahead? The gospel is always relevant to society regardless of what era we are in. The way we present it is uh, a way that we need, uh, something that we need to, to look at and in the context into which it is presented. And so the interaction between the gospel, the church, and the culture that you're seeking to influence, I feel uh, we can do more work on that. For those of us living and ministering within Māori context, we have to explore things like indigenous theology, uh, indigenous mission or contextual mission. How do we do this in the context of a tribe? Um, Western theology has given us a lot of emphasis on individual salvation and it's important. Uh, we all need to have personal encounters with the Lord Jesus. But uh, when you are in a tribal context, you can work at a tribal level as well and um, and understand that the person standing before you that you're wanting to save or you're wanting the God to save actually has a lot of history behind them, a lot of whakapapa, a lot of genealogy that is. And uh, somehow that is all has to be taken into account when you're presenting the gospel message. It is, it is something for the church to celebrate in every way it possibly can that this gospel message came here in the first place and even with the struggles and the tensions and the difficulties and fragile humanity that, that uh, you know, there were a lot of mistakes were made, nevertheless, the seed of the gospel was sown and our people were uh, exposed to, the, to its transforming power and given the choice to receive it or not. There was so much to celebrate. Above all, the mercy and grace of God that he would even uh, bother with us. And uh, so 200 years, I hope that um, my nieces and nephews, and I don't have any children, but my nieces and nephews, that their children, their grandchildren, their great-great-grandchildren and so forth will take it through to the next 200 years. And uh, we are they'll also celebrate them. So there's much to celebrate. But there's a lot of challenges in it also, and we can't um, forget about those in our challenges. But what we can do is just stop and give thanks to God. Now, mihi nui ki ao kue pane. Thank you so much for joining us today. God bless. Kia ora mania.
On Christmas Day 1814, Samuel Marsden wrote in his diary, in this manner, the gospel has been introduced into New Zealand, and I fervently pray that the glory of it may never depart from its inhabitants till time shall be no more. Two centuries on, Christianity in this country faces a very different cultural context. Heurio no raukoa no tainui waka. Wakato is my land and these are my people. The British invasion and confiscation of land was a huge injustice to my people. I've worked in the Māori youth development arena for almost 15 years and in my experience the greatest issue that's facing our rangatai of Aotearoa is identity. And identity for me around belonging, faith, connectedness and hope is found in Jesus. So in moving forward, I believe our greatest success factor for this nation will be in introducing our rangatahi Māori to Ihukaraiti, to Jesus Christ. So just in sharing who I believe Jesus Christ is, who I believe Ihukaraiti is, I believe he's Te Tamakotahi, the first man. I believe he's Te Waiora, the living waters. He is Te Toka, the rock. He is Te Kingi o Ngā Kingi me Te Ariki o Ngā Ariki, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is to me Te Whakamārama o Te Ao, the light of the world. And that brings our End Zone Focus program to a close. Thank you for joining us. Mā te atua, koutou e manaki. God bless.